Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Is everybody all ready for another big day? Just out of curiosity, how many of you were here over the weekend at all? Wow, quite a few. Well, thanks for coming back again, bright and early Monday morning. We're going to be talking about the develop module. My name is Nat Colson, and uh, we, over the last couple of days, have been talking about various aspects of Lightroom, but I think for uh, most photographers, the develop module is really the heart and soul of why we use Lightroom, and, uh, and, and so we're going to cover some of the most fundamental uh, develop processes today. Um, I will start, though, by making just a quick clarification about the difference between Lightroom Classic CC, which is what we're talking about this morning, and the new Lightroom CC. Okay, for those of you who have been using Lightroom for some time, really any time before like last autumn, um, the Lightroom that we have always known and loved is now called Lightroom Classic CC. Okay, and this is done because there's been a, an all new program spun off called Lightroom CC which is the cloud system, okay? So they are two separate programs. But Lightroom Classic is the Lightroom that you've always known. So we're going to jump right into the develop module here. Uh, as you can see, I'm in the library module now, but I'll go over to develop. And I've got a collection that I've made of a bunch of photos that are going to show some of the, the most important techniques and tools that you have available here. So we'll start with what I will call geometry, okay? And this has to do with um, perspective distortion and straightening and, you know, aligning your horizon and things like this. Um, before I get too far into um, these distortion corrections, though, I, I want to make sure to at least touch on the concept of presets. And we're going to come back around to this in just a minute. Um, but before... Before you go too far into develop, you need to at least know about uh, presets and uh, some of the other core uh, processing functions that happen with every photo that you work on. So Lightroom comes with a bunch of what are called presets. And essentially, presets literally just store the settings that are done over here on the right side panels. So you've got a bunch of the default presets. And if I open the navigator panel, you see as I hover over the presets, the, the navigator preview updates to show the effect, right? So one of the, the best ways that you can learn about the uh, develop adjustments is to try some of these presets. Uh, there's no risk associated with just applying a different batch of settings. And as you do so, these sliders and adjustments over on the right side are changed. So you can kind of learn about how the different um, settings work by applying different presets. Now, as you apply a preset, Lightroom is always keeping track of your history. Okay, So you can always go back in the history panel to any point. So feel free to play an experiment to your heart's content. And always keep in mind as well that all of your adjustments are being made in the catalog using metadata. And your original file on the hard drive is never modified. OK, so if I want to go back to the original state of this, I can use either undo and step back. OK, or you can always use the reset button down here. OK, so presets. And I'll come back around to talk about how you can make your own presets, because creating and editing and, uh, and modifying presets in your workflow is one of the key ways to save quite a lot of time. The other thing that you need to know about is this camera calibration panel. And that's down here at the very bottom right of develop. And if you've never opened this up, uh, it is quite possible to use Lightroom without ever really knowing what's going on in here. I want to at least introduce this camera calibration panel to you because as time goes on, the concept of camera profiles is going to become more important in our workflow. And the Lightroom ecosystem is kind of developing around the idea of profiles which are different than presets. So a profile essentially can store processing instructions as well, but it does it in a little bit of a different way than presets do, where presets are really just recording these develop settings. 
profiles are a little bit more tied to the, the basic raw processing from the camera file. So in the camera calibration panel, you have first uh, uh, in the list is what's called the process version, okay? And if you've been using Lightroom for quite some time, uh, you may have pictures in your catalog that are using older process versions. So you wanna just be aware of that. I'm not really trying to tell you that any one process version is gonna make a huge improvement over one another depending on the picture, but you do wanna be aware of which process version you're using because it will affect some of the adjustments that are available. Okay, if you're using a very old process version, then you'll find that some of the sliders and adjustments might look different, okay? So your process version is important because it controls the baseline processing for every picture. And then below that is the, the uh, profile list. Now you can create and save your own custom camera profiles and Adobe has also created and provided a bunch of default profiles made for this specific camera. This is a shot on the A7R2 and so you see I've got a, a custom profile for that, right? So that's just a quick introduction camera calibration. As you continue using Lightroom, pay more attention to what's going on with process version and profiles because it's gonna become more a part of your workflow. Right, so back to basis, basic processing routines. So this picture very clearly shows the effect of lens distortion, okay? Perspective distortion caused by the lens with these converging verticals. And you'll probably find this in a lot of pictures that have uh, taller buildings or even sometimes you'll find horizontal distortion as well. So the easiest way to fix this, first we wanna go to the lens corrections panel and make sure that you have a, prof a lens profile attached, okay? And as you're going forward, saving your own develop presets, you can click the add new preset button here. Activating a lens correction profile is one of the things that you should always have embedded in your default profile. And enabling profile correction is not always on by default. So that's something you wanna look at. Now you see that by checking and unchecking profile correction, the main thing that we're seeing, there's a slight amount of distortion correction but mainly it's correcting for vignetting around the edges, right? Can you see the difference there? So that's with and without profile correction. Now this is a lens profile, which is different than the camera profiles down here, okay? The idea here is that cameras and lenses have certain characteristics and Lightroom has the ability to compensate or correct for some of those characteristics very early in your, your processing pipeline. Okay, so making sure that we have profile corrections enabled and uh, remove chromatic aberration, which if we have time, we'll come back and look at that closer. Make sure that these are on. That did not correct our lens distortion, okay? So to do that, you have to go to the transform panel, and I will I'll show you a couple of different ways to approach the adjusting of this. The, what's always a good place to start is to try auto. And I'll be the first to admit that over the years, I've not always been the biggest fan of anything called auto because I like to take a little bit more direct control over the processing of the images. But in this case, you'll see that just clicking auto actually does quite a good job of figuring out the distortion, correcting, and, uh, and, and fixing it. You'll also notice, though, that in the corners here, we've got some white blank pixels that have been introduced because Lightroom has actually distorted the image at the bottom. It's squeezed it in in order to straighten out the verticals, right? We don't have anything like content-aware fill, per se, in Lightroom yet, so the best solution to getting rid of these uh, blank pixels is to click this box that says Constrain Crop. And you can see that Lightroom automatically will crop out all of that um, blank space. Now if we jump up to the Crop tool, you can see that the crop has been adjusted automatically to get rid of that, that blank space. Now you can, you can always go in and adjust it further and there's a corresponding checkbox in the crop tool for constraint to image. Okay, those two checkboxes do exactly the same thing, right? So even after you've done some distortion correction, chances are you want to fine tune your cropping a little bit. And so paying attention to that constraint to image is really important. This image looks to be shot fairly well straight, but if you have uh, photos that have uh, kind of tilted horizons or a horizontal angle, uh, correction that needs to be done, That's, that can be done with this slider, or there is a, a tool that you can click and drag to straighten it out based on 
dragging. Okay? Anytime you want to reset any of these adjustments, all you have to do is double click on the name of the slider and it'll reset it to its default value. Okay? So I would encourage you in your workflow to consider fixing distortion, uh, cropping and straightening, all of these geometry uh, corrections. Do those early and first in your workflow, partly because it helps you to visualize the image a little more accurately. If I just drag this out to the corner here. After correcting these uh, distortions now, you see that the histogram also changes a little bit too. So your uh, adjustments for tone and color, which we'll come to next, are, are going to be largely driven by any cropping that you've done. So, and, and in principle, in your, your digital workflow, you want to always tackle the biggest problems first, okay? And so cropping and straightening would, would fall into that category. Right, so that is a good example of cropping and straightening. Um, let's work through the basic uh, develop workflow. Here's an image that has been uh, ex uh, underexposed a little bit. If we go back into develop. Now, no, I should point out, normally, I, we were looking at the presets here earlier, but normally I'll work with that panel hidden, okay? You can hide and show any of the panels at any time. It, this is nice to, to give as large a preview as possible. So this image, at least on my screen, looks a little bit underexposed. And so in your processing workflow, you're going to spend as much time as you need to, and the majority of your editing time should be spent in this basic panel. I get a lot of questions asking about, well, when do I use the tone curve, um, you know, HSL, and some of these other uh, more esoteric adjustments down here. You're not going to be using these on every image. But basic is going to give you most of the controls that you need to process most of your pictures most of the way to completion. The exposure slider is the most fundamental develop uh, uh, tone adjustment, and it basically is adjusting brightness, right? You're talking luminance here, lights and darks. And you can see that as I drag the slider, the histogram is changing shape, and we can see we're pushing more of the tones to the right side, which is the highlight area. Okay, so just by doing that, we go, here's before, after. Okay, you see we've lightened it up quite a bit. Now, the top part of the sky is getting a little bit blown out, so I have a couple of different ways that I can deal with that. One is to uh, target the whites, and the, uh, the white slider affects the tones in the image starting from the very right side of the histogram, the, very, the white point, the very brightest tones in the image. If I start dragging this down, you see there's a slight adjustment visible. And if I go all the way, you'll see that it really is trying to bring back some of the tones in that range. And if you watch what's happening with the histogram, you can see the corresponding change. And it looks like highlights probably will do a bit as well. Okay, so just with a couple of quick adjustments. Now, I haven't done any local adjustments. I haven't done anything targeting certain areas of the image. I've only just made basic adjustments to the tone ranges using these named regions. Okay, so this is why I say you want to spend as much time as necessary to try and get the image looking as good as you can before you move on with the other adjustments. Uh, clarity is an, an adjustment that I use on most pictures um, because it, uh, it gives a nice contrast uh, uh, boost to mainly to the midtones. And you'll find that the clarity adjustment uh, can make a, a big uh, change mainly to pictures that have buildings and kind of structural geometry in them, but I normally apply a little bit of clarity to every image. One of the key points to using the basic panel is, in general, if, if there are any rules of thumb to follow, it's that you want to try and work with your tone adjustments before moving on to color, right? You may find in many cases that if you can get the tones looking right, you know, your, your white point and black point and all your, your mid-range mid tones where you like them, then the color maybe will fall right into place. The exception might be if the image was shot, you know, with, with uh, a, an incorrect white balance, and if there's a strong color cast, maybe you want to adjust the white balance first. But in general, focus your, your initial editing around this tone section of the, the basic panel. Uh, the contrast slider, I usually use contrast uh, on this slider instead of the tone curve, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. But Again, the idea is that these sliders provide what's called parametric adjustments, which has a nice sort of falling off. There's a rolling off at the ends of the tone range that each adjust 
So the adjustments are really quite clean and quite smooth. Okay, so after I've gone through the, the tone adjustments, then I would turn my attention to color. And the, the most basic change that you can make would be dragging the white balance temperature slider. And unless you're working, you know, in a, like a controlled environment, like a studio shoot, product shoot maybe, where you need to match colors dead on, I would encourage you just to use the sliders to just adjust the white balance to whatever you think looks right. Now, if you do need a precise white balance, then you should shoot a gray card or a color target, and you can use the white balance eyedropper to pinpoint what should be neutral gray or something close to white, and then Lightroom will color balance around that. So if I use the white, the white balance eyedropper here, you can see that Lightroom will neutralize those, uh, the, the, tone, the, the colors in that range, and you can see with the, uh, the loop preview here, that it's basically going to turn this pixel neutral gray and then everything else falls around that. But this may or may not be really where I want it to be and I think I would, I would rather it was a little bit warmer and a little bit more pink. Okay, so just use, use your best judgment and use your eyes on the sliders for white balance. So I've spent this amount of time just in the basic panel and I would say the image is getting a lot closer to where I would like it to be but I still feel like that the top part of the image is a little bit over bright uh, compared to the bottom. Now when you're shooting a reflection, generally speaking, you can expect a reflection uh, to be a stop or two darker than the, uh, the sky above. And if that's your, you know, your desired look, then you, you can just leave it as it is. But I think in this case, I would rather kind of have them look a little bit more similar. So I'm going to jump over to the uh, uh, graduated filter which is a local adjustment, which allows me to drag, click and drag in the image to place a gradient on the image that ha then has all of these corresponding adjustments available, okay? And you see this red area is where the adjustment is being applied. So this is the start of the gradient, this is the end of the gradient, and it, it's a smooth fall off between the two. You can't control the, uh, the, the gradient range here. It's always 100% here and zero here. So if you wanted a narrower fall off, then you just make a smaller edge to the gradient, right? Now another thing, I'm gonna delete that gradient. And if you hold the shift key, it'll constrain it to a straight line, okay? Which on a, a, a landscape picture like this, having a straight line on your gradient is usually the way to go. Now you see that the the graduated filter is now overlapping on these trees, which means that any adjustments I make, like in this case, I would want to do, uh, make it darker. I'm going to turn off the mask overlay. Down here on the toolbar is the button to turn on and off the, the preview of the overlay. So with that off now, as I drag the slider down, you'll see that the top part of the image is being adjusted and the bottom part is not. The problem here though is that the trees don't really need to be darkened. It's mainly the sky and the lighter tones back here that need adjustment. So Lightroom Classic CC introduces a new feature for the local adjustments called Range Mask. And Range Mask allows you to choose whether you want to restrict the adjustments being applied, uh, whether it's based on color or luminance. So in this case, I want to make sure that the things that are dark, i.e. the trees, don't get the adjustment. So I can adjust the range of tones that are being affected. And as I do that, you can see that the application of the adjustment is being tapered off. And you can uh, increase the smoothness of the fall off as well. So now I'm restricting that tone adjustment just in the lighter tones as indicated by the, this bracket here. And so now when I make these adjustments, the, the, dark, the areas that are dark or fall outside of this range are not being affected. So in the past where maybe you've had to uh, apply a brush or uh, erase and you know, apply like count, contrasting adjustments to counteract this overlap, now you've got this uh, range masking that can be uh, applied either based on luminance or color. So that helps you restrict your local adjustments. Right, so we'll switch to a different image here. 
Um, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, making panos and uh, HDR images. Now, within a couple of uh, recent releases of Lightroom, uh, has come the ability to uh, combine images either into a panoramic image like this or to make an HDR image where you're, you're blending a, a series of exposures. And you can do this now without uh, going into Photoshop at all. So if I select these three pictures, you can see here's the three that are selected. Now, I, I do want to point out that when you're shooting for panoramics, you want to use manual exposure on your camera and make sure that the exposure is the same on all of them, meaning your uh, aperture and shutter speed and ISO should all be locked down so that each of the exposures is the same. Now, depending on your lighting conditions, you may find that that means some of your exposures are maybe a little too light or a little too dark. You can fix that later. But the idea is that for the best uh, blending of a pano, you want all the exposures to be the same. So you can see that this, because of the nature of this scene where it, it is dusk and it's getting very dark, this area in the foreground here is quite dark. And so I would know that as I'm processing through this, I want to want to make sure to brighten that up. But that comes later. So first, I'm going to combine these into a pano. And you do that under the photo menu and it's a command called photo merge. Okay? And this command is available either in the library or the develop module. So you can make panos and HDR blends directly from the library module, but it is a develop process. So if I click on photo merge to panorama, I'll get a screen coming up generating a preview. In my experience, most often you can just use the default settings here. There have been very rare situations where actually making any adjustments here really made any noticeable improvement. The Lightroom is pretty clever at blending these together. So you can see just based on this preview that it has taken the three images and nicely blended them together. When I click merge, and up here is the progress indicator telling me what process is in play. Now I, I should point out that Lightroom is multi-threaded, which means that you can instigate multiple processes and it'll just spool them up and can run them concurrently. So if I wanted to continue working on some other picture, if I wanted to continue working on some other picture while that was processing, then I can do that and Lightroom will uh, process multiple pictures at once. So now that I've created this blended image. Okay, it's taken the three pictures and merged them together quite nicely, I think. It does sometimes pay to look closely and see where the seams might be. And if you find any strange artifacts along the seams or where the images are blended, you can retouch them easily using the spot removal tool. But in this case, it looks like the, the, uh, the blend is pretty good. And so I'm just going to go and, and see what the auto adjustment does now. The I, back to my, my comment earlier that I, I normally try and avoid anything called auto, the auto processing in Lightroom over the last few releases has gotten a lot better. And so in the interest of saving yourself time and, and effort in your processing, sometimes it's worth just hitting that auto tone button and just see how it goes. And in this case, I think it's actually gotten us you know, a nice improvement. If we look again, here's before and after. And I'm just using the backslash key to toggle between before and after here. You can see that it's opened up the shadows quite a bit. Now, opening your shadows is one of the main adjustments that you should be looking at when you have an image that has areas that are underexposed. And this is a global adjustment, meaning that the shadows uh, increase in tone is being applied across the entire image. But if I wanted to increase the shadows even more, I can apply a brush. I'm going to double click to zero out the exposure and just bring up shadows. And now as I paint over this area, now I'm just getting the shadows adjustment a little bit further just in that area. Okay. So this is well on its way to, you know, looking how I would like. Now one of the other adjustments that I use on the majority of my pictures is actually to add a vignette, right? Whereas earlier we looked at how lens uh, corrections, one of its main purposes is to remove vignetting caused by the lens. Well, there's a principle where if, if you want to try and keep the viewer's eye within the frame and you know, use this uh, elliptical kind of image circle to uh, uh, keep the focus of your image on the interior that you can apply 
a radial uh, a gradient around the corners here. And this is using the uh, post-crop vignetting. And so I very often will apply just a little bit of that. Now, I think in most cases, you want to apply it just far enough to where that it's not super obvious. But you can see that if you go all the way, you can get it all the way black, or you can even go the other way and do a white vignette. But I'll apply just a little bit here. And you've got adjustments for how far in the midpoint comes, right? Or push it outwards. How, how round is the shape of it? How feathered and soft is it, right? So I think it is, I'll just reset all these by double clicking. I think applying a, a, a slight vignette to the corners is worth considering on the majority of your images. And you'll see that by doing this, let me just bring this up here, you see how it has completely kind of transformed. It's remapped the, the content of the image so that the, the emphasis is much more in this area where I want it to be, okay? So if we go then to looking at blending an HDR set, so these are the images that are shot in uh, multiple exposures, right? And so it's on a tripod, and I've just manually changed the exposure setting. So I've shot one for really dark, a little bit less dark, less dark, and then one for just uh, getting the, uh, the shadow areas here. And in Lightroom, then, this is done, uh, again, under the photo merge. And you go to HDR. And again, it has to take a minute to render a preview. Now HDR very often actually takes a little bit longer than a pano because it's evaluating all of these images. And you see here's our starting point. And again, you've got some adjustments here, but the default usually will get you most of the way. If I click Merge, again we get the progress indicator. And what Lightroom is doing is actually rendering a new DNG file on disk. So it is essentially raw image data. Uh, but it, it has intelligently combined the uh, shadow exposure with the highlight exposure. Let's see if I can select the right one here. Okay, and so if we go into develop with this, you see it's got a bit of that HDR look, which I'm not really a fan of. So we, w we you can see though that it has adjustments already applied, and so you can fine tune how you want to handle the exposure. Right. And so I, from this point then, I would just go forward with my normal develop process, you know, adjusting tone first and then adjusting the color a little bit. And again, this is a, a raw DNG file uh, that's been saved on disk. So moving forward in the develop workflow, you can process this just like any other picture. Okay, so real quick, I, I want to make sure to save some time for questions. So I'm just going to take a minute to show you uh, a couple of quick things about Processing, we've been working mainly in the develop module, right, where you're working with an individual image at a time. Uh, if you want to apply a, a batch of develop settings to multiple pictures at once, like let's say I have these two images here, they're both underexposed, the white balance is wrong. If I'm working in grid view in library, I can use quick develop to change uh, settings on multiple images at once. If I increase the size of the thumbnails here, okay. So I can uh, apply a different white balance and I can apply exposure adjustments and this is being applied to both of these images at the same time. So quick develop is a limited kind of subset of the adjustments that you find in the develop module. But if you've got a, a range of pictures or a, a sequence or series that you've shot that all have similar corrections to be made, then you can uh, apply them all uh, using the quick develop panel in library. In addition, let's say if we undo that a few times, let's say that I've processed this picture, and we're going to go into develop for this. If I process this picture a certain way, and then I want to apply these adjustments to this next image, I can select both of them, making sure that the, uh, the image that I have already adjusted is the main active or most selected image. I can then click the sync button, which gives me an op option to sync over or essentially copy and paste all of my settings from the active image onto the other image or multiple images. You know, you could apply this to any number of images. 
You can check all adjustments or check none if there's just certain settings that you want to copy. In this case, we'll check all. Click synchronize. And now this image has been applied with exactly the same settings. Okay, so this all gets down into batch processing, which is something that you, working with Lightroom with large numbers of digital capture that you always want to be thinking how you can save time and work with, you know, sets of images rather than just one at a time. Uh, last but not least, uh, if I wanted to then save a preset with these settings, right? Now, th these settings are very specific to these image captures, but let's just pretend I wanted to, to reuse these settings. If I go over to presets, I get the same list that you saw in the synchronize window, where these are all the develop adjustments available. And so you can check and uncheck, but normally I would just check them all and give your preset a good name. So I would call this maybe exposure 74, clarity 23 or something. Or if you have a, a, a name that's um, meaningful to you. But the idea with presets is to give it a name so you know what it is. And then click create and now under my user presets I now have a preset using all of the develop settings over here that I can apply to new images as they come into the catalog or I can go back through my historical archives and quickly apply these settings just using the preset.